Okay, Root of Power fam, you guys are in for a treat. Sarah is so genuine, so sweet, so kind, and she is a coach for moms and she helps them feel good AF in their bodies because you know that the mom bod, it's a, well, first of all, it's beautiful. Media makes it a struggle, right? And we'll talk about the difference with that, but God, women are just miracles, you know, and we don't tell ourselves that enough. So bless you dude for working with moms because they struggle and it's unfair and they are bringing life into this world. And then everyone's like, Oh my God, you have to be like, you are when you were 19, like, fuck you. So (laughs) Sarah Oshesky, Oshesky, we're going to get it. Uh, she (laughs) is doing that. And we are going to talk about that and like what you're doing and how you are and your own experience as a mom taking this journey. Hi. Hello. It's so good to see you. Dude, it is good to see you. How did you get into, how did you get into this? Oh my gosh. Okay. So I've been interested in nutrition for a long time. And like many women struggled with dieting for a long time, yo-yo dieting, yep. um, restrictive eating, over-exercising, all of those things to try to achieve a smaller body because that's what society says we should be doing. Right. Um, I have always been a little bit more muscular. So my quote unquote BMI, which let's not go into the BMI <laughs> road, but racist. like, <laughs> did you know the BMI is racist? It racist. It was literally built to be discriminatory against people of color because really? they need to have higher body fats. Yeah. I heard that I knew, I knew it was created by a mathematician who knows zero about science, but I did not hear the racist part. Mm-hmm. That's new to me. <laughs> yep. Super fun. Yeah. So I, uh, at a young age, when I was, um, in second grade, I think we were at a doctor's appointment and these, this is one of my earliest memories. I remember the doctor telling my mom and me that I, my, my BMI was too high. Mm. And so that immediately made me feel like at a very young age, yeah. something was wrong with me and I had yeah. to be different. So fast forward many, many years of dieting, over-exercising, restrictive eating, being really oh. interested in nutrition, but also kind of to a fault where mm-hmm. I like made excuses for like reasons why I cut carbs and things like that. Sure. Um, and then postpartum, <laughs> yeah. welcome the uh, exhausted mom, not sleeping, um, trying to uh-huh. go back to being a full-time employee while mm-hmm. also keeping a baby alive and yeah. also trying to get back to your pre-baby weight. Yeah. Um, I kind of got to a point in about five months postpartum that I just had a panic attack. Like my body was just like, no more. You're done. Yeah. There has Bodies to be are really smart in that way. Yeah. I always say they'll shut you down if you're yeah, not listening. It's exactly, exactly what happened to me. And so I kind of looked at my daughter and I looked at what I was doing, what I like, why I was doing it. And I was like, there has to be a better way. There has to be like somebody has to start speaking up for the next generation yeah. because I don't oh want gosh. her yeah. or any of her friends or her cousins or anything to go through what I did. So right. I kind of just decided to, that that was like my passion now, like just helping moms realize that the, the expectation that's put on us postpartum is just absolutely. And prepartum. Ridiculous. Let's be honest. <laughs> Right. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just as women, but yeah, you're, you're so right. And I deal with a lot of moms from the like depression, anxiety, trauma angle, my cat's going wild too. <laughs> we got animals. Today. <laughs> it's, it's fine. This is real life. Um, and it, you know, they never come for that, but we always end up there and we talk about eating enough and sleeping and you don't have to work out all the time. And I had a client, um, didn't come to me for body image issues. Didn't come to me for disordered eating, anything like that. But through the process of us working together, got to the space where they said, I feel comfortable in my body for the first time ever, ever. ever. And I'm working out with less intensity. My body's actually responding better. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. that's because you're not beating it into submission anymore. And I was reading a quote the other day that says, I'm going to totally butcher this, but the point of the quote was that controlling women's eating habits and how we look and how we're supposed to look and all those things. Like it's not about being attractive. It's about control because when women are so obsessed with how we look and how we present to men or whatever, like we are constantly undermining our own worth and our own power. And it's such a powerful control tactic. And it's even worse when you have a human 
to keep alive. Right. Because that's hard. Like I don't have kids. It's so hard. I don't have them. Like <laughs> that's how hard kids are. <laughs> and I can't imagine doing that with the pressure that, that gets put on women to drop. I don't know how many pounds in six weeks. Like it's just crazy. And it's so, so damaging. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's so like pervasive too. Like oh, it's yeah. so, like some people aren't even aware that they're doing it. Mm-hmm. How many years of my life did I go through? Like, just like you said, go through my life with like, like these external yeah. intentions of, of something that had nothing to do with my life. It was literally me trying to change myself yep. or how society wants me to look. Yep. And I wasn't even living like, it Which, was yeah. <laughs> and it can be totally counter to your body too. Like, and it's really pervasive, right? So I love Pinterest. So I'll be on Pinterest and people will be like, girl, you're a butt in 30 days. Like yeah, you could, <laughs> yeah, but bitch, it ain't from donkey kicks. They'll be like really, really tiny, tiny girls who are like, get my ab workout, look like me in 30 days. And I'm like, what the f- yep. Like you yeah. are agents of the patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> I was following actually um, a mom before I became a mom. So I was pregnant. Yeah. But- <clears throat> and her whole thing is um, abs after baby. And so that was in my mind. And then when I became postpartum and then I hit, hit this wall and like yeah. decided to change the way that I wanted to be, I was like, I didn't have abs before baby. So was why gonna <laughs> am I going to have abs after baby? <laughs> it just gives like this, like it preys on our insecurities. And oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Like sure. Some women had abs and some women will have abs post baby, but mm-hmm. if you did not there's nothing wrong with that either. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I was, um, oh, I don't know where, who I was talking to about this, but they were like, you could do it, but what would it cost you? Right. And I was like, well, that's a really good question. Like (laughs) you could do it and you could potentially do it in a healthy way, but it would cost you eating out and it would cost you a lot of time. And it would cost you like, like you would have to track things. You would have to adjust things. And that that's such a fine line. And there are a lot of people who use tracking macros or tracking apps and, and they're fine and it doesn't give them a complex, but there's a lot of people that do it in a really disordered way. Yep. And that was exactly me. So like, there are people, if you, I always say this, like, if you've never experienced that type of restriction or obsession, you don't really understand it. And you're like, well, what's so hard about getting up in the morning and exercising and like eating healthy. But when you're doing it out of either hate for yourself or damage or something like that, it's completely different. And then it becomes unhealthy. And so I really like, once I became aware that I was doing that, I just, I cannot get on board with, with telling women that this is, that that's how you should approach postpartum. (laughs) And right. And there's so many flavors that work for everyone. Like for some people tracking really does work and they can Mm -hmm. do it in a healthy way. But I think too, when you're, and I'd like to talk about that is a lot of women see the consequences or a lot of people talk about the consequences, like physically how it damages your body and it throws your hormones out of whack and you can't sleep and you may miss a period and your body actually like you also can't efficiently burn fat because you're malnourished. Like you may lose weight, but it's so much more nuanced than that. But I'm much more interested in the toll it takes on everything else. Because if you're coming at your body from hatred, which is really where a lot of that stems. I hate my body. I hate my legs. I hate the way I look. My mom will say, I hate my upper arms. And I'm like, cut them off. (laughs) What? What? Like, what? What? Why are you telling your body that has carried you through this whole life? And especially for moms that has carried another life that you hate it. And you hate it to the point where you're trying to, like, there's just so, you're trying to make it smaller, you're trying to make it different. You're trying to be anything but what it is instead of just embracing what it is and how that like seeps into every area of life. Cause I'll tell you, I've never met a woman on a diet who's happy. Nope. Nope. Like, <laughs> and it's well, never going to bring you happiness. Who's chronically on a diet. I've yeah. never met a woman who is chronically on a diet who yeah. is happy. People who are dieting to lose weight or to, for a show, for building, for you know, athletes, like that's a little different. Right. Those people tend to- different category. <laughs> right, different category. So normal, normal non-athlete people. Yeah. Who aren't yeah, doing because it we're always people. doing it to achieve something in order to make us happy. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't. So- yeah it's a vicious cycle. Yeah. And it's, it's a lack, right? Like I'm not good enough. And then I think that just, 
bleeds, it like bleeds into every aspect where your house isn't good enough and your car is not good enough and you're not pretty enough and your hair's not good enough and your husband or your wife or your partner isn't good enough and your kid's yeah. not good enough because you shove them into that box. Right. Yeah. And it's one thing that you can kind of control. So why don't we yeah. might as well it's there and it's available for us to control if we want to. Yeah. And it's really about, yeah, like you said, lack in the rest of your life, Mm -hmm. living outside your values, not having passions, not, you know, right. Get a hobby being happy (laughs) in general. (laughs) So how do you see it affect the lives of yourself and the women that you work with? Like, what is it costing them to, to obsess over this like self-hatred? joy enjoying being a mom (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) like I feel like the first couple months of postpartum it was like oh can I get my workout in today and I was like basing my worth of the day like did I get in a workout wow and I see so many moms doing that and yes moving your body is amazing but if you're not sleeping just like you said before the reason you're not seeing results is because you're likely overdoing it Mm -hmm. when we're postpartum walking, yoga, like yeah. Pilates, maybe a couple like lightweights here and there. I didn't feel like a human until a year postpartum. And that's actually what research says is the recovery time is one year. So yeah. first of all, the fact that women go back to work like two weeks after they give birth, oh is gosh. fucking nuts. <laughs> also systemic issues. Some people have to, a lot yeah. of people have to, mm-hmm. um, but your body doesn't fully recover until a year later. And so when you're like starving it, when you're working too hard, your body's like, damn, bitch, can we just, (laughs) can we just rest, please? We'll take a quick little detour. I work for a global company. So it's really hard for me to be on teams with people that live in Europe Mm -hmm. that get to take a whole year off after they have their baby. And And I got a lot. Nope. No, because it's, what? it's a country thing. It's not a company thing. So in other countries, you get a year to 18 months off and you're guaranteed your job back in the U S there is no standard maternity at all. At all. Yeah. So I got 12 weeks, which is considered a lot in the U S which is, but I watched women go back to work two weeks, postpartum, six weeks, postpartum. And I don't even know how they did it because 12 weeks, postpartum, I wasn't a human a year postpartum. Yeah. I was just feeling like a human. (laughs) What do they do with the position? They just have someone like fill in until then? Yep. It's like, can we pause for one second? I'm sorry. Hey, it's okay. No worries. I can only handle so much, but then she was like, going to start barking. Uh, No, thank you. (laughs) Okay. So. What do they do with the position? Yes, they, they, so other people fill in. So oh. either the team absorbs the work or they will put somebody in temporarily to replace that person. At least at my company, this is how they do it. So yeah, you just get to leave for an entire year. And I can't even imagine what that would be like. And, and I wonder like how that bleeds into like their mental health and like mental health rates of moms in general in uh. other countries. And it's just yeah. like, Gosh, I wish that there was a way to make it happen. For One us. more question. Do they get paid? Um, I or don't like think, no, like I think it's a percentage. Mm-hmm. I think it's a percentage. It's so a percentage. yeah, it. I think it's full, full for like three months and it's probably different per country. So don't quote me on this, but I think it's full <laughs> for three months and then percentages and hmm. probably the end, maybe you electively could take zero pay or go back to work. Sure. Um, if somebody knows, tell me, cause that's interesting. <laughs> Right. Like I know it exists, but I'm like the logistics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that has a lot to do not having time off and then having all this pressure and, oh, by the way, you have to be a perfect mom and everyone, I don't know anyone who likes to shame as much as like people like to shame moms. Yeah. And then, oh, here's the other thing that really pisses me off. So moms have to be perfect. Right. And you know this because you're a mom Mm -hmm. and dad's have to not be the world's worst shit bag. (laughs) Like literally they get praised for doing nothing. Very true. The bare minimum. So then there's that. Oh, by the way. And you have to look hot. And there's all these mommy bloggers Mm -hmm. who are 
anorexic. <laughs> I'm calling it because I follow some of them and they are so thin. They're like, I'm yeah. an extra, extra small bitch. You are 40. <laughs> what? Maybe that's your body type. Yeah. But I doubt it. Mm-hmm. But you see all like the popular ones, right? The ones that have the most followers, the ones that get the most um, sponsorships. Likes, yeah, sponsorships, like, all like, those they're, things. They're so they are so thin and then they're they're the ones setting the standard and all of us other moms are looking at them like why am I not like that yep and that's what really bothers me and and we had a brief discussion before we started recording Mm -hmm. what's really getting to me about social media is it's becoming for a long time it was there was this this window where we were like oh call people out on that kind of Mm -hmm. shit and it's getting back to that now Mm -hmm. like I'm watching it slowly evolve back to like perfection and yep unattainable things. And, and I'm just like, I'm, I'm really re relooking the way that I'm using social media because yeah. Of that. Yeah. And it's hard when you like run a business that uses social media. And this is what we were talking about. Like there, there was a time where it was so picture perfect and in the bag, whatever. Um, and then it swung towards authenticity where everyone was so authentic. And it, like some people were like crying on camera and I'm like, mm-hmm. okay. I don't like people do that for marketing. Like I'm so <laughs> sad I'm crying on camera. Like what do you, anyway, that's a whole other tangent, but now it does swing, sw- swim to be swinging. It seems <laughs> to, <laughs> it swings. It seems to be swinging back to that. And I, I think people forget that it's a marketing tactic. Yeah. yeah. Like these people make money by making you feel like shit so that you want to look like them. So you buy the products they use. Now, a few of them are really aspirational. They are, they're real. They say, Hey, these are the products. They actually use them. Yep. But a lot of it is BS marketing. And that's what sells thin, young, pretty, conventionally attractive, able-bodied has a husband like that tends to sell better. And Mm -hmm. I think if people aren't very careful about who they're following, it's easy to get in that trap. And then it does affect your mental health. Yeah. Because you're constantly again, and great theme, we're coming from that place of not enough. My house Mm -hmm. isn't big enough. I'm not skinny. I'm not pretty enough. If I starve myself, then I'll be happy. Then I'll be happy. Yes, kitty. (laughs) Then I'll be happy. (laughs) Guest, guest appearance from the (laughs) Um, my dog was just staring at me through a chair. So that's <laughs> fair. Yeah. We just, I, we're just always stalked. It's okay. Um, and it does affect your mental health. And so mm. a lot of people think they have an anxiety and depression and I'm like, Get I mean, you might, like, I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to tell people they don't, mm-hmm. but I'm like, let's fix all these little things. Let's like sleep more. Let's eat enough food. Don't stay up until midnight watching all the girls do the same dance on TikTok over and over. TikTok honestly is great (laughs) and also terrible. (laughs) Well, I mean, Instagram does the same thing with the videos. Like, I feel like that that's all that I see now is just people redoing the same video and the same dance moves and, and we're all glued to it. And why, (laughs) why? Because we're little gremlins. (laughs) Do you work with a lot of clients who have a drinking problem? I think mommy drinking is such an epidemic. And anytime I talk to anyone who works with moms, I always bring it up because it is so sneaky. So I feel like, and funny, hot mess mom, the hot mess mom thing is oh. totally, um, Marketing I, hate it. I can't, I can't stand it because it gives you this image of like your whole day is chaos. And then when finally the baby goes down to sleep, you get to open the bottle of wine and all your problems go away until the next day where right. you're playing catch up. So yeah, I think um, if you're not very careful and intentional with your time and your mental health and yeah. making sure you're setting boundaries, you can get caught in that really easily. And I think that's why it's so common yeah. because motherhood can be very isolating. Yeah. And yeah, like I've experienced it. I've experienced the isolation part. And I know that if I'm not very intentional about making sure I'm journaling, going to therapy, using my tools in my toolbox that I could easily slip into that hot mess mom thing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's a really, like, I think it 
what I saw as an outsider is it came from wanting to lift women up and say motherhood is so hard and it actually is a real job that it went so far and companies were like, oh, this is now a marketing tactic because that's what they do. And it became like, it is so hard, reward yourself. It's so hard, it's uncontrollable. And like, I don't mean to be rude, but like for me, and I don't have kids, so take it for what it is, please (laughs) educate me. When you have a baby, it seems unrealistic that you literally don't have time to eat three bites of food. Like how exaggerated are those messages? Because I get it's not so exaggerated. Okay. So I don't know. There are times. So like we call it witching hour. So after work, (laughs) after work, we, um, the baby comes home from either daycare or her grandparents Mm. and the dogs are running around and she wants to be held. And I'm trying to cook dinner and my husband's trying to control the dogs and it's chaos. It is chaos. I will admit it's not always like that. So like for me, when you're, when you were home with your, with your kiddo, like for the 12 weeks, like, Mm -hmm. because the rhetoric is, well, there's no time to shower. There's no time to eat. I haven't had water in 16 days. (laughs) What? Like babies sleep the majority (laughs) of the time when they're newborns. And I get, you have to like change shepherds. You have to keep them alive. And like, that's work, but So I also think it's very, it depends on your baby too. Some babies sleep very well. Some babies nurse very well. Others you, you struggle with. And so for like, for example, I prepped a little bit of food before I had my daughter. Cause I was like, I'll be home. I can cook. There's plenty of time. There isn't. (laughs) So when you do struggle with breastfeeding, they want you to do this. Like you have to breastfeed every two hours on the two hour mark. And so by the time you wake up, feed the baby, um, change them. Yeah. You like your time has gone down to like a half an hour of like, okay, what do I do with, what do I decide to do with this minutes to 30 minutes? So there is definitely a period of time where it is, it is a struggle. Like I would forget to eat till like 11 o'clock sometimes. So yes, it does exist. And I think that's part of that whole societal like we need help postpartum. You're not just supposed to go home by yourself and be expected to cook and clean and take care of the baby Agreed. and then go back to work 12 weeks after like yeah. you're supposed right. to go home and your mom is supposed to come or your aunt right. is supposed to come Somebody. And supposed to help you, yeah. but we don't do that in the U S yeah. Which is such a disservice to families. Like the nuclear family unit. I was, um, reading about this a while ago and how it was literally, a marketing tactic. Like we were talking about this. On, yes. On the yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. So it was, yeah. Same thing. Like it was a marketing tactic to sell more stuff. Cause if you have the same family in two different households, now they need double the things. Right. And it isolates people and people who are kitty, you would, and people who are <laughs> isolated are more likely to buy things to make themselves happy. They're more likely to beat themselves up. They're more likely to Oh, it's just so connected and gross, but what can, so when you work with women, like, what do you, what do you do? Ask for help, eliminate the noise. So I think we try to keep ourselves so busy with things that don't actually matter, like working out an hour a day. (laughs) So I had um, a friend of mine who is a mom, a new mom come to me and say, how do you do your job? Be a good mom, like do your hobby and exercise. And I'm like, start getting rid of the things that like, don't actually matter. Like you don't need to be doing your hobby. So her hobby is, um, working horses. So you don't need to be working horses and running. This is like working working horses horses is is exercise. And it doesn't, (laughs) we have to get out of this idea that like the only valuable exercise is pounding pavement for an hour because it's not, especially postpartum. So Another person had described it this way. So it's like you have glass balls and you have plastic balls. And sometimes when you're juggling, you have to drop the plastic balls. Yes. Like get rid of all the things that you don't need to be doing because there's a lot of them like laundry. (laughs) There's a reason there's that meme. That's like, how long does it take to do laundry? And that's like four to seven business days for folding time. (laughs) Like it's, it's honest, it's true. And you just have to drop those things Yeah. and then do what really matters and ask for help because Mm -hmm. I think we've also made it in the society where like, we, we like shame people for asking for help. Like, Oh, you can't do it all. Mm -hmm. Sucks to be you better drink wine about it. Yeah. Right. (laughs) (laughs) 
so yeah, just like setting those boundaries, like making sure you're doing the things that are actually important and not the things yeah. that don't matter, like keeping your house spotless. So yeah. And so it's interesting. Delegate. How- <laughs> right. Well, that also assumes that you have a good partner. Yeah. That's because if you true. have a shitty partner, guess what? You are doing it all by yourself. So that may yeah. be one of the things to really evaluate, like, does your partner suck? Mm-hmm. Or are it'd they be good? easier to just do it all on your own? Cause you're probably doing it all on your own anyway. Yeah, 50% of the time. <laughs> yes. And I wager it's a higher number than that. Yeah. I work with a lot of clients where I'm like, you have two babies. One of them is your partner. <laughs> they suck. Kind of brings it back to what you said earlier. Like that, like fathers can really get away with a lot. Oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah. Which don't let your partner be a lazy shit bag. Nope. There was, no. I saw something the other day, another meme that was like, oh, Frank, let's call him Frank is the dad. And he's like, oh, Frank will have so much fun watching the child on Saturday. And it's like, yes, he will enjoy continuing his duty as a father. He'll enjoy parenting. <laughs> God bless. <laughs> it's interesting that you work with women to feel good in their bodies. And a lot of the work that you do is not working out. Yes. That's actually probably the last thing on my list. (laughs) Like I definitely encourage, like, go for a walk. If you can do some yoga, if you can move. Yeah. Yeah. Which is funny because I, I mean, I used to be a beach body coach, different story, Mm -hmm. but like before I had a baby, I was so like, let's follow a program. Like let's do a schedule. And now I'm like, don't even look at a schedule because it's going to make you feel bad because you're not going to be energetic enough at some point yeah. to do said workout. And then you're going to say, I'm not good enough because I can't do it. And it just starts that shame cycle over and yeah. over. So now I do like a completely different approach where I'm like, sleep, drink water, yeah. eat nutritious foods, work on your mental health, set boundaries, like move your body. Yeah. If you, if you got yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think there's a season for it. Like I just started working with a coach, shout out Allison. She's dope. Um, and she, like, she gives me workouts to do and we have days that we do them, but I'm also in a season where like, and again, I don't have kids like, so that helps I have a lot more time, um, <laughs> where I'm in a season where like most things are really structured. So I have the room to do that, but also if I have to do it on a different day or if like there's been days and I've worked with her for a few months now, like there's been days where I just go and I'm like, I'm doing the workout, but it's not me going 100%. Like yeah. the most I can do today is like get in the gym and lift some weights. And it's well, not even funny the about that too, is I've been looking a lot more into like, um, like your cycle and like your energy levels oh, yeah. and your hormones and like really listening to your body and being like, okay, why is it that you feel like one day you can go run three miles with like so much energy, but the next day you're just tanked. And it could be because Mm -hmm. we work on a cycle because we are women who have cycles. That's actually really fascinating. I interviewed, I'm glad you brought that up because I interviewed a woman named Leisha Drews, one of the really early interviews. So like y'all go listen to that one. Um, And the way that our energy works with the cycles is nuts. And there's actually, I was listening to a business coach a long time ago who helps women structure their business flow according Mm -hmm. to where they are in their cycle. And I was like, that is really cool. I'm not going to do it, but like that, (laughs) but it's cool. It was cool to learn about, but yeah, some days your best is 30% of your hundred percent. And some days it's your hundred percent, but if all those other things aren't dialed in, and if you're coming from a place of hate, yeah. For yourself, like yeah. it's not going it to work. work. You can't force it. You know, you can't, you, we always think like, okay, if I just was following this plan or mm, able to yeah. eat this diet then, but you can't, you can't force your body into submission. It's always kind of like you said earlier, it's always going to fight back. It's going to stop you. Like you said, I hit a wall. I had a panic attack. That was my body saying that's enough. Like yeah. it only takes so much. <laughs> And it's crazy how many people will ignore panic attacks. <laughs> I'll right. let people and they'll be like, oh, I've had panic attacks for six months. And I'm like, what the- <laughs> how are you functioning? Oh, I went and I got some Valium about it. And I'm like, <laughs> well, oh, that's the thing that, okay. So yes, I am a, a huge, like, yes, use the drugs when you need to, but sure. I'm way more about the, like, let's get to the core issue of why, why have we are normalized? Like, let's that? just put band-aids over everything. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, why are you taking value instead of assessing why you're having panic attacks? Yeah. 
Yep. Because we don't make time for ourselves. And people always know, like, it's crazy because I'm like, well, I really don't know. And I say, well, what's your best guess? And then they hit it on the nail or they hit the nail on the head. And I'm just like, (laughs) there it is. (laughs) That's it, boo. (laughs) It's so funny. Like the disconnect. Oh, that's actually really good. Because when you beat your body into submission, when you hate your body, when you under eat and over train and ignore all of your physical cues, you actually cut yourself off from such a wealth of knowledge. Mm. Is that something that you see too? Oh my gosh. Yes. And I, I've experienced it myself. So I know it's a thing <laughs> when, yeah. when you're not listening to yourself anymore, whether it's your hunger cues, your energy levels for exercise, your mental health. Like I have been on, um, I think it was like bupropion, whatever, well, butrin before. And yeah. I didn't even realize until I came off of it, how numb I was. Buspirone, I think. Something like that. Yeah. But you don't because all well, those medications numb you. That's yeah. what they do. They yep. suppress your central nervous system. And so people are like, I feel like a zombie. And I'm like, yeah. Because <laughs> you are kind That's of. That's the point. <laughs> but yeah, if you, once you start actually listening. So like I do a lot of intuitive eating with women because I think it's the only way to get you back to listening to your body instead of being like, this plan says I eat a cup of potatoes and some chicken right now. You so I do. Potatoes. And you're not even hungry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Yeah. you're right. So can you explain what intuitive eating is for people that don't know? Sure. So intuitive eating is basically, there are no rules around food. There are no moralities around food as in good or bad. You literally just think to yourself, okay, what do I have? What am I in the mood for right now? And there's no guilt behind it. So if you say I'm in the mood for a salad, great. If you say I'm in the mood for pasta, great. And you, and it's always available at all times. And so you may have to go through a period of time where you overeat because you're relearning how to listen to yourself. Yeah. And depending on how long you went restricting or over exercising or whatever, and numbed all of those cues of like, okay, this is what full feels like. This is what hungry yeah. feels like. So I, ha- I took me probably six months, honestly, to get to wow. a point where I was like, okay, I'm honestly listening to my body. So last night, for example, I made like this ravioli bake and I was like, this sounds so good. And I started eating it and I was like, this doesn't feel good. My body is mm. not happy with this. <laughs> so I gave my husband the rest. <laughs> I was like, here, you can eat this. But two years ago when I was in diet mode, yeah. I would have ate that to the point where I felt sick because I would have been like, oh, this is the one day a month I'm allowed to eat pasta. Uh, yeah. So it's really just bringing That's yourself lying. back to listening to your own cues and stop following what, you know, Susie six pack puts on like a piece of paper and tells you to eat. <laughs> right. And I, I don't know if you saw the trend for a long time, but a lot of, a lot of those influencers in quotes, um, <laughs> were doing what I eat in a day post. And I think it was yep. promoting the most disordered fucking. Yes. Shit. Yep. Great. Cause people were like, Oh my God, I should do that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you weigh three times. Well, and people <laughs> not even just like calorie wise, but nutrition wise nutrients are super important pre-pregnancy during pregnancy postpartum oh my god and if you're taking advice from someone who has zero knowledge or training <laughs> in nutrition that could be very damaging like for example there are a lot of women out there who promote veganism during pregnancy and you cannot get enough iron you know, like u- utilizable iron. So let's just say that. Sure, there's iron and spinach in general. Choline, folate. These are all e- essential in pregnancy. Right. Humans are meant to eat animals. <laughs> no, literally. Do we're I feel? Do I feel exactly. sad? Yes, but it also tastes good, and it's giving me nutrients. <laughs> and it's we're meant to eat it. <laughs> right. <laughs> we're meant to eat it. Like, don't be. Ugh. And I think. Mm, side note: I think vegans ignore the human toll that mono agriculture takes because no food is blood free. Mm. No food is blood free. I live in a farm community. The food's not blood free. Right. Very true. I never thought of it like that. Yeah. So I think they ignore that part and that's a whole other thing, but yeah, humans are meant to eat meat, but yeah, these people like don't have, because people want an easy fix. Right. And we're Mm -hmm. lazy and we've been taught like attractiveness at all cost without really consenting to the cost because people aren't honest about what it costs. And again, like some people can track and can 
be paleo and can be primal and can be keto and they're happy and they're thriving and their body works that way. You cannot be vegan and be that way. Come at me, (laughs) vegans. I don't give a fuck. I don't care. (laughs) Veganism is not healthy. I don't care. Um, But there are people that can do it, but the percentage of people that can do it and have a really healthy relationship with food is smaller than people that use it for disordered eating. And I think a lot of people don't want to admit that they have disordered eating and it's a lack of knowledge because this is just the normal. Like I have never worked with women where a majority of women were not taught either on a diet, which was all the time talking about how much they ate. Oh, I, it's okay. I'll have it now because I'm going to blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah. Who cares? Like, like validating every single thing that they do around they have to food or exercising. It. Yep. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's hard now that I'm so aware of it to have regular conversations <laughs> with women who are not, because I have to just try to change the subject. I'm not going to try to like coach them right. right there that they didn't ask for it. Right. So to be around something, it's so common. It's like, it's, it is wild it's everywhere. <laughs> and I'll tell you, like, I started working with my, my coach, Allison, and she, um, she had me track my food for a few days and I like, well, mostly it's annoying to me because I don't <laughs> remember and I have to input things. And it's like a thing that I have to do. And it's like, um, but she has worked with dozens of people, like dozens, and she'll have people track their food to make sure they're, you know, eating whatever. And she said, I am the first woman she's ever worked with ever. And she has done this for a few years now that has ever come close to 2000 calories, Mm -hmm. which is like where you're supposed to be sitting as an adult. And she's like, you are literally the first woman ever. And I was hitting like 16 to 1800, sometimes 2000, just depends if I was eating a lot that day. But I was like, and I said, what, like, hi, puppy. (laughs) And I said, no, that's okay. This is real life. We're authentic. Yeah. Um, but I said, where do women normally sit? And she said, most women eat like a thousand calories a day, which there is were, I remember because I would be reading like 17 magazine or something like that. And oh literally God. I remember here's 12,000 calorie diet, 12,000 calorie diet. And 1200. that's or 1200. <laughs> yeah. 12,000 12, is like Dwayne Johnson. 1200 <laughs> calorie diet. And that gets drilled into our heads. And so yep. we think that that's what you're supposed to be eating. When I was on a 1200 calorie diet, <laughs> I was irritable. I was moody. I was exhausted. Yeah. yeah. I was forcing workouts. So yeah. living like that is just miserable, miserable. Yeah. And yeah. you're never going to become happy by forcing that kind of, yeah. because then you think, okay, well, fine. I've reached my goal weight and then it's not sustainable. So you go back to what you were doing, which is the exact issue with diets in the first place. Right. And I had, this broke my heart. I had a client, one of my first clients, absolutely wonderful, wonderful woman. And she was to the point where like, she would not do things that she really wanted to do because of the way that her body looked. Hmm. And I was like, you are going to give up adventures because your thighs are bigger than you want them to be. Mm-hmm. So sad. And I think like, we don't think about that cost. Well, I can't go to the beach in a bathing suit. Yep. Literally lift missing out on your life. On your life because you're, you're built different. <laughs> you're belt because you have a belly, like it holds your organs in. Mm-hmm. It's doing its job. And I don't know if you, if you do this, but I have found something really helpful is like an affirmations ladder. Hmm. We're talking about that. like, if women are listening to this and they're like, oh shit, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, not everybody does that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought that was normal. It is. It's just not helpful. Yeah. Um, I will typically take people through an affirmations ladder where like, if you're at the place where you're restricting and you hate your body and you're avoiding things because of how you look or how you think people will judge you for how you look, whatever. It is impossible to go from that to like, I love my body and oh, yeah. my body mm-hmm. is fabulous. And I am a goddess. Like you are, it is, but it feels really fake. Mm-hmm. So I will have women start with literally like my body keeps my bones intact. <laughs> <laughs> and that's nice. Like that's my nice. stomach holds my organs. That's helpful. And I have them literally start with things like that. And they're like, well, that feels silly. And I'm like, but at least it's honest. Yeah. 
I totally agree. I think that's why women think that you just walk up to a mirror and start repeating affirmations and then you believe that it's not realistic. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Love the affirmations letter. And I'm like, just start with like, you have a body. Yep. Thank you for getting me from A to B. (laughs) I have a body and it works most of the time, (laughs) (laughs) but that feels so much more honest. So if it does, if when you like, what are the biggest um, determinants for you when you're working with women, if they're like, Oh, like I do a lot of these things. It kind of sounds like me. How do you know when someone's in this space where like changing things would be helpful? Does that make sense? So kind of like, how do you know that what I teach is going to help them? Yes. Okay. (laughs) So I have like a, like a questionnaire that I have them go through. It basically outlines like, okay, how many times have you been on a diet in your life? Like what diets have you tried? Yeah. And then I have them journal out different little sections of like, okay, when we talk about unlimited food or unlimited carbs, how does that make you feel? Like, does that bring you up for you? Yeah. (laughs) So if you're, if this is you and you're like, Oh, that I checked that box. How does the scale make you feel? If you're in a great mood and you step on the scale and it says something you don't want, does it ruin the rest of your day? Yeah. And it's so sneaky. Like it really is little things like that. Yep. Little things that you're probably doing on a daily basis that you don't even realize you're doing. And I know this because I was that person. So no judgment. I was there. Let's just talk about it. It's kind of like you said something. I just watched one of your reels and you were like, it's just a skill. That's all, all this is, is it's just like you're building skills and it's hard. It's, it's simple, but it's difficult because we were I was doing it for 25 years. Yeah. Right. I told people like, wake up and walk a different way. Yeah, exactly. Simple little things like that. You're in a habit right now. Brush your teeth with your other hand. (laughs) I don't know if I could do that. So it is so (laughs) awkward. Like, but that's, that's, you're right. And everything is a skill, loving your body, not giving a shit about your body, eating well, like learning to rest. All of those things really are just skills. And mm-hmm. they're simple skills. Like I have people all, all the time. David asked me yesterday morning. He said, I know I'm probably going to know your answer. Um, David is bae for people who don't know. <laughs> and he said, how do you, how do you get more disciplined? And I said, David, how do you get better at playing the piano? And he was like, damn it. Practice. <laughs> Practice it. And I was but like, we that's... Want the, like the quick fixes. <laughs> so <laughs> right. hard. Quick fix is practice. That's it guys. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like how do you build a better relationship with your body? You practice having a better relationship with your body. That's it. And it's that simple. And, and I think initially for some people it's neutral. Like, oh my God. You so know, honestly, if everybody years ago space of neutral, I'm fucking happy. Like, mm-hmm. just don't care about your yeah, body, right. take care of it, but like stop paying attention to it except to take yeah. care of it. Like years ago, if somebody would have made a comment about my body. It would have ruined probably my week. I would have gone on a crash diet. Oh, like now if someone says something, it's a neutral feeling because I created human. I've had cancer. Sorry that my body doesn't look the way you want it to. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Die mad about it. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I wonder if it's, it must be a very different relationship to when you've had cancer. I forgot that you did. Um, but I'm glad you brought it up because that I wonder, and this may or may not be true for you but I wonder if that felt like a betrayal. So then it makes like loving your body a little bit harder. Mm. I don't know if that is something that you felt. So I think there's always that part where you're like, I should love it because Mm. it carried me through cancer, Yeah. but But that doesn't just fix it. Yeah. So you still have to do the work and the practice. Yeah. You would think like, okay. And I think there are actually, so personally, I feel like there are women in the world or people in general, um, who are very, like when they survive cancer, they're very proud. And I was never like that. So for me, it was more like, I didn't want really want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's just like, like you said, for all those things, it's just skills and learning to, it was, it was not something I was expecting. (laughs) Like after college, all of a sudden I had leukemia. And so that didn't mean that all of my traumas and all of my work that I needed to do up until that point just went away. Mm, So it still played into my life and I still had to do the work. So yeah. Yeah. 
It's interesting. Yeah. It's like an interesting cross-section mm-hmm. of that because you're, you know, not intentionally, but like your body did harm you. Again, right. not like intentionally, but intentionally, I think it makes yeah. it a little more muddy mm-hmm. for things like self-love and self-acceptance and another reason to embrace and accept your body. There are some schools of thought, not that I agree with this, <laughs> but there are some schools of thought um, where they say like how you feel towards your body can manifest in disease. So like if you mm. spend your whole life hating your body, like it's going to start like autoimmune disorders. So they will, again, don't agree with it, but there are some schools of thought that say like, because you hate your body all the time, like your body starts attacking itself. So it will develop autoimmune. Funny that you've brought this up because I'm actually listening to a book right now that is a little bit about this. Interesting. Um, So it's almost like the, your thoughts become your beliefs become Mm -hmm. your reality. Yeah. Um, they say when you're in a really unfulfilled job that you tend to get sicker more often. Oh yeah. So it's all about like your gut brain access and Mm. your, your gut health in general and those things. So is it, is it causation or is it just correlated? Because if you're living in that type of mentality, you're probably not treating yourself very well with food or alcohol or stressed out. Yeah. And you're stressed out. You're probably not sleeping all bad for your gut. So in turn, your immunity is lower. Your health is lower. So it was an interesting assertion. It feels victim blamey to me to say like, well, your thoughts created your autoimmune disorder. Like, uh, Mm. okay, well, I don't know that I go that far. Well, so it's about genetics though. So like you had those genes they were just not turned on because you were living a different way. So if you start living a super unhealthy life, Mm -hmm. you're having a lot of toxins in your life that could turn on different genes in your body. It was interesting. It was an interesting assertion, Mm -hmm. but I think it's, everything is so much more nuanced than like, yeah, there's no black and white. white. You switched to like, I ate a donut. So I turned on my (laughs) gene for leukemia. Like it didn't didn't happen. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I dieted. So I have an autoimmune disorder. Like, it, yeah, I think it's much well, more. There's actually like, so in, in relation to like the leukemia thing, mm-hmm. there, the science came out that said that, so mixing sodium benzoate, which is in diet soda with uh-huh. vitamin C creates benzene, which can lead to cancer. So I was drinking a crap ton of diet Mountain Dew in college. Did that lead to my leukemia? Maybe, maybe doesn't mean that like diet soda causes cancer necessarily, but right you're turning on different genes in your body. You're turning off different genes in your body that could potentially make you more susceptible to things like that. It's wild to think about when you, when you get like that meta, Mm -hmm. it's a lot makes my brain. That's how my, that's how my brain works. I'm like, right. What is this? (laughs) Science is good though. All right. So how do people find you? And if you want them to remember one thing, Mm. what would it be? In relation to mom's postpartum, I think the one thing I want you to remember is that it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to not do everything. Yes. (laughs) Love that. And you can find me on Instagram at Cyril Shusky. You can also find me on Facebook. Um, I have a website that's just Cyril Shusky.com. Can you spell it? And yes, O-L-S-Z-E-W-S-K-I. And I have no H at the end of my name. (laughs) So S-A-R-A. Yes. And then spell it one more time. <laughs> O-L-S-Z-E-W-S-K-I. And I also have a podcast. It's Good Enough Mama podcast. Kind of ties in everything we talked about today. So, <laughs> And it is a good podcast. How's your podcast going, by the way? It's good. Um, I'm rethinking a little bit of the direction that I want to take with it. But Word. Yeah. I love I like it. it. I'm on a break right now. So I'm filming a bunch of these. Uh, mm-hmm. which is what we're doing right now uh, for 2022 because I decided to take a break for the rest of 2021. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now too. I, I have literally an interview sitting ready to go and I'm like, it doesn't feel right. I don't know what it is, but something doesn't feel right. I'm taking a pause. Um, yeah, love it. From social media in general. So yeah. just kind of reevaluating where I am. <laughs> but people can reach out to you on social. Yes, yes. I still check it every day. But I just don't post every day right yeah. now. Yeah, sometimes that's nice though. Mm-hmm. takes away a lot of pressure <laughs> all right my dude thank you so much this was you're good. welcome I like it <laughs> I hope so I hope people find value in it 
I think they will. And if they don't, I can't help for bad taste. (laughs) (laughs) I literally can't help you. (laughs) I literally cannot help you. I'm sorry. All right, fam, go be good. Have a good day. And remember, you can ask for help and you don't have to do everything yourself. Yes. Okay. Bye. Bye.